Welcome to the Oxford University Psychiatry podcast series. You're here with Daniel Morn and Charlotte Allen, both advanced trainees in Oxford Deanery. Today we're going to be talking about schizophrenia. This is a very important condition in psychiatry and is one that's sometimes difficult to understand, especially for students first starting out in the discipline. So Daniel, maybe we could begin by asking what the word schizophrenia actually means. Schizophrenia actually means split mind. But importantly, this doesn't mean split personality. Often people equate a schizophrenia diagnosis with a Jekyll and Hyde type of presentation. But this is actually quite far off from the truth. The term schizophrenia was first coined by Bloiler in 1908 and was intended to describe the separation or splitting of the different functions of the mind between personality, thinking, memory and perception. It sounds then that like schizophrenia affects a huge number of different cognitive and mental functions, but can you say exactly what it is? Yes, you are right. It, it does affect lots of different cognitive functions and I think the most important thing to realise is is it is a serious mental illness. It's characterised by psychotic symptoms, including hallucinations, delusions and thought disorder. Schizophrenia affects a person's ability to distinguish between what's real and what's not real. As a result, they can begin to think, feel and behave in ways that are out of character from, for them. And they can begin to develop beliefs that are not real. They can begin to experience things which aren't real and their thoughts can become disjointed and confused at times. And as a result of all these different things going on, they can often become distressed or fearful, sometimes agitated. How common is it? Well, there's an overall lifetime risk of about 1%. The onset is characteristically between 15 and 45 years. Unlike men, Interestingly, women show a, a bimodal peak of incidence um, across the ages, with 10% of women having their first onset in middle age. There is a slight male preponderance, which is more pronounced in more severe forms as well. I think you've given us a good idea about what schizophrenia is overall. Can you tell us a little bit about the symptoms of schizophrenia? Yes, the symptoms can be grouped into two main categories, positive and negative symptoms. Positive symptoms are called positive because they don't appear normally in the general population, but they are present in those with schizophrenia. These include hallucinations and delusions. Negative symptoms are deficits of normal function, such as reduced emotional responses, or confused thought processes. Other negative symptoms include social withdrawal or poor motivation as well. And can you say anything about what causes schizophrenia? Well, the causes are multifactorial and include genetics, life stressors, obstetric complications, drug and alcohol use. There are many different causes and it can be quite hard in any given individual to really pinpoint what the causes might be. You mentioned genetics though, so is schizophrenia a heritable condition? It is a heritable condition, but due to the polygenetic contribution to the condition, it's more accurate actually to say that a person inherits a vulnerability of developing the condition rather than the condition itself. In other words, schizophrenia might develop due to the cumulative effects of several genes polymorphisms. It, although it should be noted that those with schizophrenia are a genetically heterogeneous group and it's likely that both genetic and non-genetic forms exist. Okay. You also mentioned drug and alcohol use. Can you tell me a bit more about the contribution of substance misuse to schizophrenia? Well it's widely accepted that Psychoactive drugs such as amphetamines, cannabis, LSD and ketamine 
can provoke psychotic symptoms in both those with schizophrenia and actually healthy controls. There was a, a well-known la uh, large cohort study in Sweden of actually of their of their military conscripts, and they found that cannabis intake at 18 years of age was associated with an increased risk of later psychosis with a, a relative risk of 2.5. And interestingly, this, this increased to a six-fold uh, risk for heavy users. So that study is quite well known because it, it shows um, a dose-related effect. Um, and it's, it's accepted that cannabis clearly does increase the risk but its impact on the development of schizophrenia, some say now, is not as great as previously feared. OK, so there's some evidence that it, it might increase the risk, but it's not necessarily going to lead to schizophrenia. That's right. Are there any other risk factors that might contribute to the development of schizophrenia? In theory, any environmental stressor or significant life event can trigger the development of schizophrenia. Factors such as social adversity, social isolation, migrant status, and in fact urban life as well. The, there are many different factors that are associated with an increased risk. In the past, schizophrenia was known as a functional illness because it was thought that there were no actual changes in the brain. But I know that now we've got a lot more advanced tools to investigate brain structure, things like neuroimaging. And I just wondered if you could say anything more about the structural brain abnormalities that are found in schizophrenia. Yes, there have been many studies that uh, use structural imaging techniques, such as CT or MRI scanning, that show consistent abnormalities in people with schizophrenia, including decreased brain volume, particularly of the frontal and temporal lobes, thalamus and white matter tracts. Enlarged third and lateral ventricles are, is a common finding. Small and medial temporal lobes, decreased cortical grey matter and reduced cerebral asymmetry are, are other common findings. It sounds like there are quite a lot of macrostructural changes then. How about on the microstructural level? Is there any evidence to suggest that there's anything going wrong in terms of neurochemicals in the brain? Yes, the main neurochemical implemented in uh, schizophrenia is dopamine. Um, this was originally actually due to the accidental finding that phenothiazine drugs, which blo block dopamine function, reduce psychotic symptoms. Another factor which supports this dopamine hypothesis is that amphetamines, which trigger the release of dopamine, can induce psychotic symptoms in healthy individuals and those in schizophrenia, as I mentioned earlier. In addition to this, all antipsychotic drugs are dopamine receptor antagonists, and or, or at least interact with the dopamine in a modulating fashion, as some of the okay. modern drugs do. And there's been a good study showing that affinity with the D2 receptor correlates with clinical potency of the medication. It sounds like dopamine is then a very important chemical in schizophrenia. Are there any others that are also important? Yes, more recently glutamate has been found to be involved, in particular the NMDA glutamate receptor. Antagonists of this NMDA receptor, such as ketamine or phenylcyclidine, or PCP as it's more commonly known, can induce a schizophrenia-like psychosis. How would you actually go about diagnosing schizophrenia? Well, I think it's best that we focus on the subtype of paranoid schizophrenia here. There are other subtypes, including hebephrenic and catatonic, but these are much less common. OK, so we'll focus on paranoid schizophrenia for today. OK, so if we use the um, World Health Organization's ICD-10 diagnostic criteria, then you would need specific symptoms for at least one month. This is opposed to the American DSM system, where you would need symptoms for at least six months for a diagnosis. So, taking the um, World Health Organization, the ICD-10 criteria, which is what we use here in the UK, you need either one primary symptom or two secondary symptoms for at least one month. And what are the primary symptoms? Primary symptoms include 
thought echo, thought insertion, thought withdrawal and thought broadcast. Can you explain what these are? Well, first of all, dealing with thought echo, this is the perception that your thoughts are being heard out loud. So that's actually a hallucination. Moving on to thought insertion, withdrawal and broadcast. Thought insertion is the belief that somebody else or something else is inserting thoughts in your head. Thought withdrawal is the belief that somebody or something is taking thoughts out of your head. And thought broadcast is the belief that your thoughts are being broadcast, a bit like a radio, into other people's heads. OK, and are there any other primary symptoms? Yes, there's, there's quite a list. There, next, there's delusions of control, influence or passivity. These are beliefs that somehow you are being affected uh, by an external agency or someone else. So you believe that you are being controlled, your movements are being controlled, your thoughts are being controlled, your emotions are being controlled somehow, maybe telepathically or by some other method. Are there any other symptoms? Yes, delusional perception is a, a, a primary symptom. And this is an interesting symptom which is thought to occur at the onset of a psychotic episode where it is a, you have a, a normal perception that's followed by a delusional interpretation of that normal perception. Can you give me an example of delusional perception? An example of this might be... Um, Seeing a red car, for instance, uh, walking down the when you walk down the street, and then coming to the belief that seeing the red car means that you're being followed by the MI5, for instance. We've covered quite a number of primary symptoms. I'll just run through them. So it's thought echo, insertion, withdrawal or broadcast. Also delusions of control, influence or passivity, and delusional perception. Are there any other primary symptoms? Yes, there are. No, this, this group here is about hallucinations. There are specific hallucinations um, which are auditory mm -hmm. and they are quite specific and they are for schizophrenia. And they include hallucinatory voices giving running commentary of what the person is doing in a given moment. So, for instance, um, talking about... Um, the fact that they're cooking dinner and they're making themselves a cup of tea and they're sitting down and watching TV. So it's a running commentary. Another example of a hallucination that's a primary symptom is third-person hallucinations, which is when 